I'm Bill Trefiro. Chicago's Morning Answer continues on AM560, The Answer. From the Matrix Home Solutions Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. Listen to AM560, The Answer, online at 560theanswer.com, on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy, President Biden yesterday in rolling out uh, the new things that uh, the federal government's going to do in response to the Omicron variant, had to this to say about the Sixth Circuit's decision to allow for the vaccine mandate he imposed through OSHA for employers with more than 100 employees to move forward. The vaccination of test rule for businesses with more than 100 employees. The rule requires employers with 100 or more employees to protect their workers who are on site and indoors with the requirement that they be vaccinated or tested each week or go home. These rules are going to keep workers safe and keep workers safe will help keep businesses open. When people are vaccinated or tested, they're much less likely to get sick and less likely to spread it to others. Customers are more likely to come in and shop because they know it's a safe environment. I know vaccination requirements are unpopular for many, not even popular for those who are anxious to get them. My administration has put them in place not to control your life, but to save your life mm-hmm. and the lives of others. Mm-hmm. Well, the Supreme Court Monday uh, had received several appeals asking Justice Brett Kavanaugh to stay that Sixth Circuit decision because, of course, Kavanaugh rides point over the Sixth Circuit. Uh, what do we expect the high court to do, what will be the ultimate fate of this vax mandate. For more on that topic, we're pleased to be joined by William Jacobson. He's a clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. He's also the founder of the indispensable blog LegalInsurrection.com and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Uh, there's uh, some concern that uh, if uh, this was put to the uh, entirety of the court, Justice Roberts would consider the vax mandate a tax. Ha ha ha, a la Obamacare. <laughs> but um, uh, what do you think? What, what, where, I mean, especially Kavanaugh's disposition towards uh, lawmaking by administrative bodies combined with uh, at least four of his colleagues, their seeming disposition, what do you think is the final result with respect to this mandate through OSHA? Well, I think that there's going to be a 5-4 vote uh, to stay it on the ground that OSHA has no such authority, that it exceeds their authority, uh, and that whether it's good or it's bad, this was not a way you could do it. And so I think that will be the result. I think it will be the three liberal justices and probably Justice Chief Justice Roberts uh, taking a hands-off approach because that's the approach Roberts took in all the religious liberty cases involving lockdowns, particularly in California and elsewhere, where the argument was that religious organizations are being treated more harshly than similarly uh, uh, situated secular uh, organizations. So you could, you know, go to a fast food place, but you couldn't go to church, that sort of thing. Uh, And he was totally unsympathetic to that. So I think that he will defer to the government not want to be the one who gets accused by left-wing media of killing people. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it's 5-4, but that's not a, a certainty. I'm not saying mm-hmm. that with any degree of confidence. Uh, I, I think it, you know, uh, it, it'll be a close call. I don't know if another justice will go the deference sort of route. The, this this uh, standard, though, for OSHA uh, rules, you know, the, the emergency standard, well, if it's, I mean, and, and again, the disparate treatment, uh, like you were just mentioning in the religious liberty cases, well, why 100 employees? Why not 95? Why not 125? Why not all employ, uh, employers, regardless of the number of employees, if this is a existential threat to the, the public health? Well, I think that 
the question would be whether OSHA even has the authority. Now, if they have the authority, then they could go down to, to one employee employers. But the fact that they didn't cho- choose to exercise their complete authority, I think would, you know, I don't think that would negate it. They either have the authority to impose such a mandate or they don't. And I think the lower courts were pretty clear. Most courts that have looked at it, uh, you know, the Sixth Circuit did two to one uh, decide that they could do it. Uh, And if you read that decision, it was very much a political sort of decision that, you know, the world is ending. This is, Mm -hmm. I think, in the first paragraph of the Sixth Circuit two to one decision, the court mentioned that there's no going back to the old normal. So it was a very strange sort of decision. I think a lot of judges are very hesitant to interfere in public health or be seen as interfering in public health decisions. And in most cases, that's right. But this is really unprecedented. But if it's uh, this is. Yeah. If it's such an emergency, why are we waiting a few more weeks to start it? Why wouldn't they demand to start it right now? Well, I think that they they did. take the position that they needed to give large employers some time to come up to speed and to accommodate and put the systems in place. But you're right. Why wasn't this done earlier? That's a question. And I think that there are no good answers to that, that if it was truly such an emergency, why wasn't it done six months ago or nine months ago? Mm -hmm. Uh, And the fact is that, uh, is there any evidence of workplace spread? Uh, I don't think there really is any such evidence. So I think that it's a, it's a, it, not only do they not have authority, but if you look at like what the Fifth Circuit said, uh, they also, it's a basically an irrational decision that it's just imposing something because you can, not because you have actual evidence that it's going to make a difference to the emergency you claim you're trying to, to solve. So there's multiple problems with it, and that's why I don't think it'll survive the Supreme Court, but don't you know, underestimate the power that, you know, people are going to die sort of approach uh, could have on the court. Well, and the other um, matter, too, for all of those uh, uh, on-again, off-again fans of Starry Decisis, uh, certainly there are fans on the left um, when it comes to Roe v. Wade, but the, the cases involving such OSHA mandates, uh, the precedents are on the side of those opposed to the mandate, those who suggest that OSHA doesn't have this sort of uh, plenary power when it comes to imposing these uh, public health mandates. Right. And there's, again, there's no evidence of work that workplace spread is the problem. Uh, you know, and that, that's the, the whole thing that this is a, a rem it's a remedy in search of a problem. Not that the, there isn't a problem with COVID. Obviously there is, but workplace spread, what is the, the justification for that and for mandating a vaccine or testing uh, you know, for large employers. So that's it. It's, a, it's an irrational government reaction to a real problem. Uh, but that doesn't just because there is a real problem doesn't mean everything the government does is either authorized by law or rational. Yeah. Mm. I mean, if you look at the, she just our, our mayor just implemented a vaccine passport pretty much to get into restaurants and bars. But if you look at and to gyms, but if you look at the spreadsheet, you know, the pie sheet where transmissions are high, Gyms don't even make up one percent, so I, they're not even following the science and data that is right before their eyes. Right, and of course you can go to a protest. That's okay. You right. can go to a riot. That's okay, but uh, you can't go to the gym. So this is all, you know, uh, very irrational sort of stuff. And again, not that there isn't a real problem. Obviously, there is, but government is just, you know, uh, kind of punch drunk with power. Uh, trying to mandate that people do things and threatening their livelihoods if they don't without any real basis of proving that people going to work, not being vaccinated, uh, is a threat to public health. health. It's It's a coercive means. It's basically saying, we want you to get vaccinated and you'll lose your job if you don't, as opposed to being on the job is actually a public health threat. Uh, I want to get to another topic. Uh, uh, this was on your blog at uh, legalinstruction.com. We mentioned it. The uh, Windsor School in Boston, which is a girls' school, is moving away from calling girls girls. Um, and this against the backdrop of uh, what's happened uh, in your league, the Ivy League, since you're at Cornell. The uh, Leah Thomas, the uh, dude who swam for the Penn team for the first three years and now is swim- the men's team. 
and now is swimming for the women's team and is about to set world records in some of his events, not to mention dominating the competition there. But the problem, it seems to me, is that the NCAA has so decreed that you can participate in sports based on how you identify. Is there legal recourse uh, under the Civil Rights Act for, uh, say, the parents of female swimmers at Penn, for example? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that specifically, but certainly this does seem to go against the legal protections that have been put in place to protect and encourage you know, women's full participation in university, including in university and college sports, uh, because it doesn't take um, many people like the swimmer to uh, destroy the careers of uh, women in sports because, uh, and we saw this in Connecticut, there were some Connecticut lawsuits right. about uh, some runners because it only takes one or two people to dominate the sport um, in order to deprive all the other participants of those opportunities. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is a real issue that nobody is really willing to address because of the blowback that's going to happen. Uh, but where are the feminists? Where are the people who fought right. for the laws protecting women's sports? Where are the feminists who claim to be, you know, uh, unbullied and um, not afraid of anybody? Well, they seem to be very afraid now to speak out for these girls' sports um, that, you know, are under attack because, you know, this swimmer at Penn broke, beat the nearest competitor by 38 seconds. I mean, in swimming, that's that's. That's Unheard a lifetime. <laughs> uh, the records are being blown away. It's not even close. And um, where are the Catholics, too? It seems to me that there's an opportunity for a Catholic school to say what the NCAA is trying to do is an infringement on religious liberty. If there were any Catholic schools that were actually Catholic left uh, that would defend the uh, faith-informed education they're char they say they're charged to provide— because, uh, say, for example, you had um, a female who wanted to kick on the Notre Dame football team uh, or, again, any other ca a female basketball player who wants to play on the Gonzaga men's team. You know, is there any Catholic university? And this is an imponderable, but it seems to me this is also a place where pressure could be applied. Is there any Catholic university that would be willing to give up? Would Notre Dame be willing to give up its football team? Would uh, Gonzaga be willing to give up its basketball team? Uh, in the name of religious liberty, if this was imposed by the NCAA, if, if a Leah Thomas came calling in one of those schools and um, and take this, take the NCAA to court over this and, and perhaps provide some of the pushback that seems to be uh, lacking at present. I don't think so, because the issue is not, you know, women trying to get on the men's team. OK, um, that, I think, has been an option for just about forever. I mean, there have been examples of uh, female kickers and things like that on, on men's Vanderbilt, football teams. Right. You know, so that has never been the issue. Really, the issue is biological men being on biological female teams and dominating the sport because male biology across the board is, you know, stronger, bigger, bigger lungs, you know, bigger muscle mass, all those sort of things. And somebody who is in, I think I saw a statistic and it might be slightly off on the number, but there are three or four hundred high school boy runners who would be number one if they ran in female sports, meaning high school boys are beating world records if they had run as a female. And yeah, but so, yeah, but yeah, no, I understand that. But but so say it's a, so say it's a, a male runner who wants to be on the the cross country team at Creighton. Really, doesn't matter because the the issue is not dominance. The issue is as a Catholic, uh, I believe that uh, your biological sex is immutable. That and so we don't recognize that as true. We recognize that as a lie, and we're not going to participate in the lie. And that is our faith. And that, to me, is, is a more compelling cause of action than suggesting we this should be changed because a somebody identifying as a, 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 a female who's a male is dominating. Yeah, I mean, it, it may not be a perfect analogy, but I think it is an analogy of the cases involving forcing, um, you know, uh, sisters of the poor to hand out abortion pills, yeah. that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or whatever the specifics were of that case. So, yes, I mean, I think that that 
that could be an issue. It's not one I've really examined, but to the extent you are forcing somebody. But let's face it, uh, most of the, the brand name Catholic universities are really secular. I mean, they're, exactly. they're you know, Georgetown. I mean, Georgetown's right. about as left wing as you can get. Right. So they're really secular institutions that um, might have some patina of um, religiosity to them, but they're not really religious institutions. I think it would be a little different if you had a, a truly religious Catholic institution um, that adhered to the principles of the faith, uh, or Jewish Orthodox institutions, yeah, right, um, right. Or, you know, Yeshiva that, University uh, or whatever, right, yes. Exactly. So those would probably be better examples than the Notre Dame or the Georgetown or the, the brand names that we all know that we you know, maybe think of as Catholic universities, but they're really not. They're secular institutions, and Catholicism for those universities is really just part of their brand. Yeah, ornamentation. Yeah, lamentably, you're correct. Uh, he is Professor William Jacobson, clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell, founder of LegalInsurrection.com and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks as always for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. This is Chicago's morning answer. Santa's coming to town. Yeah! Oh, my God. On AM 560. Santa here? I know him. The answer. Folks, when shopping for a home mortgage, how much is great service, low closing costs, and competitive interest rates worth to you? At Townstone Financial, it's priceless. Hi, Barry Sterner, founder of Townstone Financial. Let's hear about the Townstone experience from one of our customers. My name is Melissa.